Welcome to week four in History and Systems of Psychology. In this lecture, we're going to learn about German psychology and some of the pioneers who helped establish psychology as an independent field of study in the late 1800s. We will learn about three different groups of German pioneers. The first group tried to use math to explain the mind. Wundt is considered the father of psychology and the third group studied memory. Let's start with a brief overview of the pioneers we will learn about in this lecture, as well as the zeitgeist of the times. Here's a list of some of the most important German contributors to the field of psychology. The first three individuals were active in the early 1800s. The next four individuals you see here were active in the mid to late 1800s. This list is by no means an exhaustive list. There were many, many more Germans who contributed to the field. The important thing to note is that psychology was born in Germany, not in the United States, not in England. It was born in Germany. In the early 1800s, Germany was a popular place to go to college. There were plenty of universities open at the time in fact, Europeans from all over the region moved to Germany to go to some of their very prestigious schools. These institutions promoted the scientific method. If you remember from our previous lectures, this is about the time, the 1700s and the 1800s, this is about the time that the church begins to um, lose power and the scientific community begins to take hold as the primary way of exploring the world and trying to answer the questions we have about the world. So on the tails of this transition, we have German institutions promoting the scientific method. They called this philosophy Wissenschaft. There are no women present in this particular lecture. One of the reasons for that is because women were not allowed to attend college until the mid to late 1800s. And this was true both in the United States as well as in Germany. Johann Erbart was a German psychologist who was one of the first to give it its own name. What he studied wasn't quite philosophy, but it wasn't quite physiology. He is also known as the founder of scientific pedagogy, which is the study of the science of teaching. In 1824, he published his, his book, and I wanted to include the title because it explains how he looked at psychology. Experience, metaphysics, and mathematics. He tried to explain psychology using math and physics and his training in those areas. In his book, he wrote about his belief that we learn by observing and thinking about our environment, about the external objects in our environment. He called these external objects reels. This lecture, this video that you're watching, it is something in your external environment in order to learn something about that object, you have to pay attention to it and think about it. He also believed ideas compete to be in our conscious. Those ideas that you are currently aware of, those ideas that you are currently thinking about, make up what he called the apperceiving mass. Sometimes ideas that are not part of the apperceiving mass compete and make their way into it. If your cell phone rings, if you get a text message, if you get an email, the presence of that stimulus will now take your attention away from the video and, and lead you to focus on something else. In that moment, the cell phone is part of your apperceiving mass and the video said is no longer part of the mass. He believed that these ideas could be represented by different strengths and these, these strengths, these different levels of intensity can be um, described in mathematical terms. In the early 1800s, Ernst Weber was also active 
he was a physician and conducted a variety of experiments in an effort to understand sensation and perception. He studied tactile sensitivity by measuring, by mapping the sensitivity of different parts of our skin. He was interested in determining the point at which two different points on the skin are noticed, the point at which we can tell that there are two points instead of one. And what he found was sensitive skin has a lower threshold than less sensitive skin. The most sensitive parts of your protective layer require a smaller distance between two points than the tougher, less sensitive areas of your skin. So take a look at the, the three images that I have here on the slide. On the tongue, two points only have to be a millimeter apart for you to be able to determine, oh, yep, that's two needles, not one. On the fingertip, the two points, the two needle pricks, and they, they weren't meant to hurt, but the two needle pricks have to be about four millimeters apart for you to recognize that there is, there's a difference. There's two different points instead of one. On the shoulder, um, it has to be anywhere between 35 to 75 millimeters. So there's quite a bit of a difference between your tongue, your fingertip, and your shoulder. Your tongue is going to be the more sensitive uh, organ compared to your shoulder. He also looked at how much a stimulus must change in order for you to recognize a change, for you to see the change, hear the change, feel the change. For instance, how much heavier must a weight be for a person to notice that the weight is heavier. The amount of weight that is required for you to perceive a difference, that amount is called the just noticeable difference. The difference at which you are just able to determine there is a difference. Gustav was a German philosopher and a physicist he is known as a pioneer in experimental psychology because he founded psychophysics, the study of the relationship between stimuli and sensation. So for instance, a light in the room. Fechner was interested in how your eyes perceive that light, how changes in that light impact your perception and the different thresholds at which those changes must reach in order for you to perceive the difference. So Fechner, um, who was one of Weber's students, he took Weber's ideas about the just noticeable difference and he tested them. So let me explain a little bit more about this, this idea of stimulus change and then I'll show you an example. True to his physicist roots, Fechner developed a law. He called it Weber's Law as a tribute to his mentor. This law says that as the intensity of a stimulus changes, think about a light bulb or a noise, as the intensity of the stimulus changes, a greater difference between it and the comparison stimulus is needed in order for individuals to perceive a change. Let me show you an example to explain. Do these two boxes have the same number of dots? Don't count the number of dots and don't think too much about it. Do these two boxes have the same number of dots? Again, don't think too much about it and answer quickly. The difference between the two boxes on the left is 10. The difference between the two boxes on the right is also 10, but most people take a few milliseconds longer to judge the second set on the right. When there are just a few dots, it is easy for us to pick up on that 10 dot difference. We can see it easily. When there are many more dots, a 10 dot difference is not enough. It requires a 20 dot difference, a 30 dot difference before we can perceive 
a difference between the two groups. So the first set of boxes has low intensity. The second set of boxes has high intensity. Weber's law says that as that intensity increases, a difference between the original stimulus and the new stimulus, that difference needs to be greater. Thus, a 10 dot difference is just not enough with the boxes with more dots. Here's another example. One weightlifter bench presses 50 pounds and notices the addition of five pounds. A second weightlifter who bench presses 500 pounds does not recognize the addition of the five pounds. It would require 20, 30, 40 additional pounds before the second weightlifter would, would likely recognize, oh, this is heavier. Now that we've covered the first group of German pioneers, let's take a look at the father of psychology, Wilhelm Wundt. In the mid to late 1800s, Wundt began to make his mark on the field of psychology. Most historians consider Wundt to be the world's first true psychologist, as well as the founder of psychology. And I will tell you a little bit more about the defining moment, the moment that historians consider to be the birth of psychology. I will tell you about that in just a few minutes. He attended medical school in the 1850s and earned his MD from the University of Heidelberg, but he never actually ends up practicing medicine. Instead, his goal was to establish a new type of science. He was influenced by Robert Bunsen, the inventor of the Bunsen burner. He studied experimental physiology with Johannes Muller, and he also worked with um, Helmholtz in his lab for some time. For most of his career, Wundt taught physiology courses at several German universities. After working with Helmholtz in his research lab, he began teaching at the University of Heidelberg, where he had earned his MD and where he taught the first scientific psychology course. I put scientific psychology in air quotes because it wasn't really scientific psychology as we know it today. It was more of a physiology class than anything. Then in 1874, he started teaching at the University of Zurich. He was not happy there and moved to the University of Leipzig in 1875. It was at this university that he conducted his most famous work. Wundt is considered the father of psychology because he promoted it more than anyone else. He did this in a variety of ways, and we're going to cover some of those strategies he used to spread the word about scientific psychology. In 1873 and 1874, he published the world's first psychology textbook, Principles of Physiological Psychology. At the time, the word physiological meant experimental. We really didn't have a word for experiments at the time, so the word physiological means the same thing at the time in Germany. In his book, he urged researchers to apply the scientific method used in the physical sciences to psychology. He believed that some of the similar methods and procedures might prove useful in psychology. Also in his book, he includes descriptions of anatomy, of the brain, its functions, the nervous system, and some of the characteristics of sensation and perception. Here are examples of some of Wundt's illustrations in this textbook. Uh, this one on the left is his illustration of Golgi's illustration, and this one on the right is his illustration of Kajal's illustration. So both of these nerve cell researchers were active and publishing their work. Wundt used their work in his own book. In the mid-1870s, sometime after he was hired at the University of Leipzig, 
he begins to collect equipment in a tiny room on campus. He initially collected this equipment to be used for teaching demonstrations. He would bring his students into the lab or sometimes bring the equipment to the classroom to show his students how different equipment could be used. But he didn't actually conduct any experiments just yet. He collected tachistoscopes, chronoscopes, sensory mapping devices, electrical stimulators, pendulums, and a variety of different timing devices. On the slide, you see uh, two different examples of Vunt's equipment. These were actually used um, in Vunt's teaching demonstrations. You can find some of his equipment um, in museums and also on some really shady auction sites. It wasn't until 1879 that Wundt and his students began to conduct psychology experiments. In the beginning, they studied sensation and perception because Wundt did not believe that complex human experiences like problem solving, he did not think these higher mental processes could even be studied using experiments. So he and his studies stuck with sensation and perception, the more physiological aspects of psychology. Many historians consider this lab to be the first experimental psychology lab. 1879 is the date that many historians agree is the birth date of psychology. It is because this is the date when Wundt, the father of psychology, first began to conduct psychology experiments. Unfortunately, Wundt's lab was destroyed in World War II by Allied bombing. We did lose some of his original equipment and some of his lab notes. To collect information from his participants, Wundt relied on a procedure he called internal perception. This procedure would be adapted by some of his students and other pioneers in the field of psychology. Eventually, it is replaced by what we know today as scientific psychology. At the time, though, internal perception was experimental. This was as, as experimental as it got at the time. So what is internal perception? What is this method? He would bring participants into his lab. He would have them experience some type of stimuli, a a light, a visual, a sound, and have them describe that experience, that stimuli, uh, describe their sensation and perception as it occurred. So as they're listening to this sound, his participants are describing what they're hearing and how they're hearing it. Eventually, this method becomes Edward Titchener's experimental introspection. Here's a picture of Wundt in 1880, sitting in the chair, surrounded by his students in his lab. One of the reasons Wundt is considered the father of psychology, and one of the reasons he was so popular at the time, is because he was dedicated to his students. Throughout his career, he supervised 186 dissertations. That is impressive. At SIUE, a PhD professor might supervise a handful, three or four dissertations each year. Wundt was supervising at the time double, triple this number. He supervised Hall, Cattell, Kreplin, Munsterberg, Kulpe, Titchener, Spearman. These are big names in psychology, and he supervised all of their dissertations. This is important because his students, his PhD students, would then go out into the world, go back to the United States, go back to their home in Europe. They would take his ideas with them. He ended up training over three dozen American psychologists. Many of his doctoral students ended up establishing their own experimental psychology labs 
academic journals, and even uh, bachelor and master's programs in psychology at other universities. So again, one of the reasons he is so influential is because he influenced his students who then influenced others. Okay, now that we've talked about Wundt, the father of psychology, we have one last group of German contributors to discuss. Ebbinghaus, Muller, and Kolpe, and uh, some of their contributions to German psychology in the 1800s and even the 1900s. Hermann Ebbinghaus was a German psychologist who was well known for his study of memory. He conducted most of his experimental studies using himself as the only participant, but he was able to identify several principles of memory that have stood the test of time and that we still know to be relatively true universally today. In the 1870s, Ebbinghaus began to study memory using what he called nonsense syllables. I have a couple of examples at the bottom of the screen. These are syllables, things that can be pronounced, but that have no real meaning to the test taker. So in English, these would be nonsense syllables. He also studied how humans forget, how much they forget, when they forget, how often they forget it. He studied practice the difference between cramming and distributed learning. And he also studied how we learn information in a series, how we learn to string together a variety of different ideas in order to remember them. Remember that Ebbinghaus studied only his own memory. He did not bring in freshman students from Gen Psych and ask them to complete memory tests. He spent months at a time trying to memorize different lists of words and recall those lists of words in an effort to figure out how memory works. Lists of seven or fewer syllables can be learned in a single repetition. Memory performance is better when learning is distributed as opposed to cramming sessions. The rate of forgetting is rapid at first and then slows over time. All three of these conclusions are true of most humans in most cultures. Let's take a closer look at Ebbinghaus's forgetting curve. He studied the rate at which we forget information. After you take an exam, a multiple choice in-person exam, you begin to forget information rapidly, quickly. The rate of forgetting is fast at first. In the first few days, you will forget most of the information that you're going to forget. After a few weeks, that rate of forgetting begins to slow. And after several months, Whatever it is that you remember after several months is probably going to hang out in your memory for quite some time. Georg Elias Muller is also well known for his experiments on memory. He was a German psychologist who earned his PhD in 1873 from the University of Göttingen. Muller disagreed with Ebbinghaus about a few things. Muller took the stance that learning and memory require more active participation that in order to learn the human really has to make an effort uh, and participate in the process. In order to support this idea, this deviation from Ebbinghaus, Muller did two major things that Ebbinghaus did not do. Muller invented his own equipment in this image, you see his memory drum, which was a device that rotated and presented different stimuli to his participants. And that's number two. Muller studied the memory of participants, not of himself. He actually brought people into his lab and using his equipment, presented different stimuli so that he could measure um, the outcomes. He also discovered a concept known as retroactive interference. This occurs when 
when new information that we learn interferes with our ability to recall other information. You might experience retroactive interference during finals week when you're trying to study for two or three or four different tests. If you have two tests on the same day, say two tests on Wednesday, the information you learn for the second exam, the afternoon exam, can make it difficult for you to learn information for the first exam, for the morning exam. Uh, the second exam information interferes with your recall of the information that you learned first. The final German pioneer that I'd like to talk about in this lecture is a man by the name of Oscar Kolpe. He was a German psychologist who is actually known by many historians as the second founder of psychology. One of the reasons that many of us don't know about Kolpe, one of the reasons he's not as famous as Wundt and some of the other early pioneers, um, is because he was a big supporter of structuralism, of structural psychology, which eventually falls out of favor and is replaced by functionalism and behaviorism. In the 1880s, he studied with Wundt, the father of psychology at the University of Leipzig, and he earned his PhD in 1887. He also worked in Muller's lab for one year. Although he studied with Wundt and Muller, he had his own ideas about how the human mind worked. He did not agree with the two of them that complex mental processes could not be studied by the experimental method. Kolpe believed that complex thoughts, complex processes, even complex behaviors could be studied using the scientific method. So he adapted Wundt's original method of internal perception and called it systematic experimental introspection. It differed in a few minor ways, but one of the things that he did that was different from Wundt is he had participants wait until after they completed complex tasks to describe their experience. Wundt presented stimuli and had his participants describe their experience as they experienced it. Kolpe also made two other discoveries that are worth mentioning. He found that people tend to use the same set of problem-solving strategies across tasks. He considered this, he called this a mental set, a person's typical way of solving a problem. He also found evidence for imageless thought, the notion that ideas are not always based on images. The idea that sometimes we can think about things without having a mental representation of those things in our minds. And one final thing about Kolbe, two of his graduate students, Wertheimer and Kafka, eventually went on to establish Gestalt psychology, which was fairly popular in the early 1900s. So that's all for the week four lecture. Um, I will see you next week to learn more about Charles Darwin and his theory of natural selection, as well as Francis Galton.